Okay, it is 942. And we are going to go ahead and get started as usual with um, some centering with some Lectio Divina. Um, so I would ask y'all, I'm in a rocking chair right now in my attic. So if I start doing this <laughs> and it's making y'all nauseated, just like give me a stop. <laughs> um, I noticed the other day I was like a rocking on a Zoom call. And I thought, oh, that must be difficult <laughs> for the people who are watching me. Um, but go ahead and put your feet uh, flat on the ground and maybe intentionally uh, hand over to God any of the stresses that you brought into um, this place today so that you can be present here before God and before one another. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So that you all can see our readings today. The first one is from uh, 1 John chapter 1 verses 7 through 9 and the second is from an I am not entirely sure how to pronounce her name but I will try uh, Ijuma Olua. And it's a quote actually that um, Aixa Marchand, our presenter for the last two weeks shared with us as kind of her closing last week. And I thought it worked well for us today. Um, I'll open us in prayer and then I will move uh, straight into the Lectio reading. So let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us that through these words, both ancient and new, we might hear what you would have us hear and see what you would have us see, that we might be formed into the people, into the disciples you need us to be for the living of these days. It's in the name of Christ that we trust and pray. Amen. So I will read these readings side by side, and in the minute of silence that follows, I invite you to meditate on that word or on that phrase that is especially striking to you. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward. And now using the chat feature, I would invite you all to share that word or that phrase that was particularly striking to you as you feel led. We deceive ourselves, deceive ourselves. including in yourself. Forgive us our sins, confess, pretend. He is in the light. Deceive, we don't have to pretend. Cleanses us from all sin. Forgive us, pretend. 
fellowship. We deceive ourselves. Confess our sins and cleanse us. Fight racism, including in yourself. He is in the light. We so frequently say he is the light. Truth is not in us. You don't have to pretend. Walk in the light. <clears throat> Cleanse us. All right, continuing to hold whatever word or phrase was most striking to you. I'm gonna go ahead and read these side by side again. And this time in the minute of silence that follows, I would ask you to meditate on um, how God might be speaking to us through either of these words today or both of them together. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward. All right, now using the chat feature again, as you feel led, I invite you to share, including in yourself, wherever you find it. Connection between honesty and progress, wholeness. Commitment is the way forward. If we are in true fellowship with one another, it will be impossible to be racist. We deceive ourselves if we pretend to harbor no racism. It's the only way forward. Removing the deceptive veil of being a good white person and hard truth telling is the only way forward. Commitment is the only way forward, walking in the light with Christ. We, us, our, these sins are personal, institutional, and systemic. Thank you all for taking this time. Um, every time we do this, I'm reminded of why we come to the word uh, together. <laughs> um, there's a place.
coming to it as individuals. And this is always a reminder that um, it's really best done in community. So thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this share. Here we go. Um, Y'all, thank you for, uh, for being here today. Um, this is part two of Ottawa Racial Roadmap that we're gonna do today. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, this study uh, began with a question and that question was, how is my racial identity shaped and reshaped by the history I have learned and the circumstances I have encountered in my life? And uh, throughout this uh, semester, uh, for lack of a better term, um, y'all, a, a number of you have shared your racial but individual Did we lose Sarah? I think we might have. Sarah, it seems as if your connection is leaving us behind. I'll text her. Well, how about this while we wait for Sarah to come back as we move into Idlewild's racial roadmap. Um, Perry, Steve, and I kind of work together about what are the stories that we can tell? What are the stories that we tell about church? Um, and I think Steve phrased it best when he talked about the um, sit-ins at the churches when he said, there's a story that we tell but then there is another story. And so what is our institutional memory? And so I just wanna kind of harken back to the summer. We invited Perry um, to an adult forum this Sunday. Um, I mean, over the summer to kind of, Perry is our historian. She knows the history of Idlewild Church. She wrote the history books. And so Perry joined us for an adult summer Sunday school. And in the midst of that class, Perry asked one question. And that question was, well, does anybody remember what happened to Bill Aldridge? And we all kind of looked at one another and went, A, who is Bill Aldridge? And uh, B, no, what happened? That, that one question, I believe, was an invitation into looking at a collective, Idlewild's collective um, racial roadmap. So that kind of sent me into the archives. In case you don't know, our archives used to be kept in the Jones building and during the renovation, they got taken to a cubby in the Strock room. And so they're just, they're books of minute, session minutes and, that are and sermons that are filed away in a cubby on the second floor of the Strock room. And so I began to pour through the minutes and there are two things I'd like to say about that pouring or the examination of the minutes. One is the evolution of Idlewild and who she is. Um, you can see the struggle for social justice and how hard it was for the church through time. Um, through different events. And I was really looking from 1950 kind of to the early 70s. It's the time period I was looking at, those two decades. Um, so you see the character of Idlewild. I mean, I, it was developed before 1950, but you see the wrestling of, can we be a voice in the city, a prophetic voice in the city, but also at what cost can we risk being a voice in the city? So some of the same struggles that we see today, um, you know, we had an every member canvas and some of those who went out on that every member canvas were meeting with resistance from people they met with because of the, the, the stand the church was taking. And um, those kind of things were documented in the session minutes. So I just, I wanted to start there as a reminder, the way we're gonna tell this story today is Perry's gonna begin and um, following Perry, we've invited Beth Simpson because she actually, she, you lived through this, Beth. Um, there was a time when the young adults of the church, when Beth was a young adult in the church, um, they brought a letter, they brought actually two letters to the session. Only one stands in the records of the session. And Beth is gonna read one of those letters to us and just share a little bit about that time. And then I've drawn some other things out of the minutes that I would like to share with you as well. So that's kind of how we're going to progress through the day today. So Perry, without, I think Sarah's back with us, maybe. 
Um, Perry, I'm going to Perry, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and I'm going to share my screen as we move forward. Perry, you're muted. I think I'm now okay. Well, my husband and I joined Idlewild in 1965 when we first moved to Memphis. And at that time, Idlewild did have a reputation of being forward looking, uh, progressive, <clears throat> and so forth. Very quickly, Memphis dissolved. February 1st, not February. 1968, the garbage men went on strike. It was called the garbage strike or the sanitation workers. They had terrible working conditions. They had to go into people's backyards. They had no place to change. They were paid very little money and um, they were not paid for days that they were told not to come to work like on a rainy day or a snowy day. What uh, started the strike was on a rainy day, two of the workers had gotten crawled into the back of one of the garbage trucks to get away from the rain and the truck crushed them. You see these big trucks going around now and how they wind all the garbage and crush it. Well, it crushed two of the workers. Uh, the, uh, the rest of the men went on strike. They wanted better wages, safety, a union dues checkoff. They wanted to form a union. Henry Loeb had been the mayor for a year and he was absolutely adamant that he was not going to deal with them, that this strike was illegal, that he was not going to even talk to them about it. Particularly, he got upset about the idea of the union dues checkoff. Quickly, the strike became racial. All of the sanitation workers were black. Henry Loeb hired some uh, scabs to take up the slack and they were white. So very quickly it became racial. <clears throat> Civil rights leaders like Bayard Rustin and Roy Wilkins and James Lawson came to Memphis to support the strikers. Bill Aldrich had become the assistant minister at Idlewild in 1966. One of Bill's more radical crazy ideas was to start a coffee house, which we did. Uh, and it turned into quite a ministry, not exactly what we expected, but very meaningful to us. Hey, Perry. Yeah. Could I interrupt you for just one minute before you move into the coffee house? I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. I just, I have drawing from session minutes. Uh, I do have a response of the women of the church that they had asked for a voice and a meeting place about um, meeting at the church to make a difference in the garbage worker strike. If I could share that one slide. So this, these are the session minutes where uh, the moderator advised at the meeting that a member of the church that several Negro women, wives of the striking sanitation workers, felt that if they could meet with other white women at Idlewild Presbyterian Church, that there was a strong indication that they could settle the strike. The moderator informed the member that only regular meetings of the church could be held without the specified approval of the session of the church. And that since many of the elders would be in attendance at the Wednesday night dinner, he would set the meeting for that time. The moderator further advised that on Wednesday afternoon prior to the 7.30 meeting, the point being, if you can see this second slide, in fear, the wives, they, they were given permission to meet by the session but in fear, the wives of the Idlewild members sent word to inform the moderator that it would be impossible for them to meet. So the women thought they potentially had a voice and uh, in fear, they turned away and said, we cannot meet at Idlewild together. 
Okay. Thank you, Perry. The garbage strike went on. It seemed interminable. Uh, various civil rights leaders came to Memphis to uh, talk to the workers and <clears throat> there started being marches to City Hall almost every day from Claiborne Temple to City Hall. Uh, Bill Aldrich marched with the strikers. So did a good many other uh, white ministers. Um, it, but it got more and more, uh, here's where I'm reminded of it right now. <clears throat> there was rioting against the, as the march was going down uh, Main Street. Uh, the police tried to stop it with tear gas and they shot and killed a 16 year old boy. Does that sound like today? But anyway, <clears throat> Malo was adamant that he was not going to meet with the strikers. Um, there was violence. A, a lot of it was blamed on a group of young black men called the invaders who were not strikers. Uh, they were um, just, they got a lot of the blame when uh, uh, windows along Main Street were broken and there was rioting during the night. Anyway, on March 16th, Martin Luther King came to Memphis <clears throat> and he was at that time planning his March on Washington, the Poor People's March on Washington. So the uh, Memphis garbage strike was really just a sort of a sad thing to him. But when he came and he found out what the situ situation was in Memphis and how the strike was going no place, he announced that he would come back. He did come back. He, the, uh, the night before, um, on April 3rd, he gave his mountaintop speech, his famous mountaintop speech at the Mason Temple. Um, the next day, he led the strikers in a march. And that night, Martin Luther King was shot. He's staying at what is now the Civil Rights Museum which was one of the few places in town that black people could stay. It was owned by a black couple and it was um, uh, one of the few places that black people who were traveling could find to stay. King was shot on April 4th. On April 5th, there was a big meeting of the clergy, white clergy and black clergy. The numbers were something like 150 white to 35 black, but it, there were so many ministers now that felt they needed to support the strikers. They met at St. Mary's Episcopal Cathedral, close to downtown. And Dean Dimmick, who was a little teddy bear of man, seized the cross off the altar and said, I will lead. And then he handed the um, cross to Rabbi Wax. But uh, that's just an aside. The ministers went to Mayolo. You know, for 150, for 200 ministers to be standing in front of the mayor, he did see them, but he just was adamant again that he was not going to talk about uh, to the strikers. It was totally illegal, and his position was the right one. Martin Luther King was killed on April 5th. Here's one more thing. The strike had gone on so long, and feelings were running so high that there was a meeting at Idlewild that night of community leaders talking about plans for a, to keep the youth of Memphis occupied. Uh, so they were expecting a long hot summer if the strike was not settled. Um, and there was meeting the police, uh, girls and boys clubs, boy scouts, uh, churches, all sorts of people were meeting in the parlor at Idlewild. It was an integrated meeting um, to talk about planning for the summer to keep the youth from being out of school and restless. And all of a sudden there was a knock on the parlor door. Loeb had sent the police. He knew that this meeting was happening and he sent the police to tell them Martin Luther King has just been killed and the mayor has declared a curfew. So will you all leave right now? And of course the meeting broke up with that. Anyway, 
um, after Martin Luther King was killed. The strike was settled in about two weeks. So one thing that's little known about it is that the way it finally got settled was Mr. Anonymous, Abe Plow, who was one of the most generous men in Memphis and was like to, to give things anonymously, told Henry Loeb he would pay the difference in what the garbage strikers wanted the salary and for the rest of the year, what it would cost the city. Henry Loeb had to give in and the, uh, there were riots all over the country after Martin Luther King was shot. I think the reason there was not more rioting in Memphis, everyone was tired. The strike had gone on so long, feelings were running so high. Anyway, the day all the white ministers joined the, in the march, Bill Ulrich wrote a letter to um, the mayor. And I guess it was on Idlewall Stationery. Anyway, he was identified as a minister at Idlewall Presbyterian Church. And um, he pre presented that letter to the mayor. Harry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you just one here. I'm going to pull the letter forward so we can see some of the language of that letter. And then we also have a photograph that we'll share. And then Perry will come right back to you. So um, Reverend Aldridge was representing a committee of the Presbytery and where this letter came from. Um, but if you read that first paragraph, all congregations of the Presbytery have given an affirmative response to the questions of the 107th General Assembly, which states in effect that these churches have no policy which excludes persons from participation in the Lord's house on the grounds of race, color, or class. And then if you move all the way down to the last paragraph, it says that the committee requests the Presbytery to commend all peoples, black and white, who have refrained from violence as the means of achieving what they believe to be rightful ends and always deplores the use of violence by Christians and non-Christians. Okay. This, this let, and then it was signed by William, by Bill Aldridge. Um, this became a point of crisis um, for his um, life in the church. And here's this picture. If you see this, this, this is Bill Aldridge right here pointing um, adamantly at Mayor Loeb here. If you notice at uh, Mayor Loeb's knees under his desk, there's a gun. But this is that day that they took that letter and read it to Mayor Loeb. Okay. The garbage strike was settled um, pretty soon. And Bill Aldrich very suddenly left town. He and his family uh, picked up and left. And close friends, as we had been with the Aldriches, they didn't tell us goodbye. We didn't know him. I never knew. I figured that the church got on him about uh, reading this letter and marching so prominently. But I didn't know that until Anne went to the minutes of the session. When I was writing the history of the church, I was given all the um, Pro, uh, worship programs, uh, newsletters, everything like that, but I never saw any of the minutes of the session. Um, anyway, Anne found out what had really happened. Anne. So Perry, what I'm going to, I'm going to put up the session minutes um, next. Thank you for your patience with us as we kind of flip back between telling the story and looking at some of the documentation. So these are, am I sharing? No. Oh, I'm sorry. These are, this, um, this is the passage um, I'm reading right here where my cursor is. 
Dr. Aldridge complimented Dr. Jones and the session in their efforts and response during the recent racial tensions which gripped the city, apologized to the session and congregation for having acted on occasion without quote unquote, perhaps the necessary love, advised that he could not apologize for the position that he had taken, nor had the same changed, that the Presbytery of which he is a member, the Human Relations Committee did report that the Presbytery meeting to be held on April 23rd, 1968 would have certain matters which would bring about great controversy. And for this reason was advising the session in advance that he would resign as of June 1st, 1968. So there was pressure on Dr. Aldridge to resign and he chose to resign. Um, so the, the, the knowledge that we have comes from um, some phone calls that we, we just kind of went down a rabbit hole kind of trying to chase the information. So Bill Aldridge's widow is still living. And so we called, her name is Elizabeth, just called Elizabeth and said, can you tell us about this time? Actually, I believe it started with a phone call to Beth Simpson who directed me to Corinne Lane. Corinne Lane still keeps in contact with Elizabeth Aldridge, put me in touch with Elizabeth Aldridge. So then I just called Elizabeth and said, can you tell me about these days? Um, so before I do that, I wanna tell you, you know, on, along the hallway where the head of staff's office is, there are what I like to call the hallowed hallway of men. And they're all the portraits of the pastors who have served Idlewild um, since the beginning of time through a certain period. Denton is the last person on that wall as an associate before you turn the corner and then you go down towards the Christian formation suite and that's where all the women appear. That's where uh, Louise Lawson shows up and then we began um, ordaining women. But in that hallowed hallway of men, Bill Aldridge does not have a portrait as one of the associate pastors of the church, which I think is interesting. That tells us something about the church. The second piece is um, Ann Covington was working the front desk one day when she got a call from the front desk at church, when she got a call from Memphis Theological Seminary. They were cleaning out the basement at the school down the street on Union, and they found a portrait of um, the Reverend Dr. Bill Aldridge, and they said, since he served Idlewild, would you like this portrait? And Ann Covington called Steve and said, Steve, we've been offered this portrait of Bill Aldridge, would you like it? Steve went down that hallway and there were, <laughs> he's like, yeah, we need to know more about Bill Aldridge. And um, so Steve received this um, portrait from Memphis Theological Seminary. So if you were to walk out of the head of staff's door right now, there's a portrait of a handsome young blue eyed man, a young one, um, that's Bill Aldridge. So um, that is the portrait that we have at church of um, Dr. Aldridge. That's how he's been immortalized in the pastoral walls. But that story is kind of an unknown story if you don't know who that person is. Um, so I called Elizabeth and said, can you tell me a little bit about, I explained to her, you know, Perry's question of Sunday school. And she said, well, let me tell you about that time. And I think the best way for me to tell you about it is in reverse. And I'm gonna start at the reception the church held for us, the church hosted for us upon our leaving. She said, we had a reception line and Bill and I stood in that line and people came through the line and some just nodded and said, thank you for your service. But then others took our hands and leaned in and whispered into our ears, we support the work that you are doing, we're so sorry. And she said of that time and standing in the TK Young room in that uh, farewell reception, all she could think about were Jesus' words, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. And still to this day, she's carrying the pain of that dismissal. And so when we think about institutional memory, for me, um, I knew there was that blue eyed portrait of that man right outside my study, but I didn't know who it was. <laughs> I have learned that story in retrospect doing some history. Um, so that we had a pastor that we dismissed because he had a too public of a voice in the garbage worker strike 
advocacy for the garbage workers. I could not find any record of this, but some of the oral history that I was given is that he had actually moved for um, the technicality that was gonna be the controversy that would come to the presbytery is that he had taken presbytery funds and advocated those funds to be distributed to the garbage workers' families um, for support. So it became a financial issue. And so that was the technicality that he was gonna be either forced to resign or, um, but really I think the, well, I don't need to say that. I think it speaks for itself. During this period of history, the young adults of the church um, came to the session and there were two letters that were presented to the session. I'm gonna um, share my screen one more time. Um, oops. The clerk read the minutes of the meeting of May 1st, 1968, 1968, and then I'm gonna skip down to the last paragraph. The first communication on the agenda were remarks by Walk Jones III and Mrs. David Simpson III, who presented letters, one of which is attached hereto, requesting that the session provide guidance and leadership in this urgent endeavor to put the concern of those signing the letter and their compassion into action. There were some 75 families represented in the signatures to the letters, only one of which is attached. Beth, I'm gonna invite you now um, to read this letter. And then if you can tell us a little bit about um, this season in the church, please. Oh Lord, Beth, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the turmoil and disturbances in recent months in our city have brought us to a new awareness of the urgent problems of racial division in our community. Now, as never before, is the time for the church to lead in positive programs designed to alleviate suffering, poverty, and racial discord, while cannot forfeit its role of continued leadership in the community. The challenge of this crisis must be met within the church. We must not relinquish our Christian responsibility to agencies outside the church, thereby passing up this great opportunity to witness and express our commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are seeking ways in which we as members of Idlewild may demonstrate our love. This letter is written to the session to ask for your guidance and lead in this urgent endeavor to put our concern and compassion into action. Beth, if you don't mind, I'm just just to take a little, um, I'm just gonna read who the signatories were on this letter. So it was Walt Jones, Marion Jones, Kirk Fry, Ray Turner, Jerry and Ann Freeman, Frank Campbell, Kaki Tanner, Camille Dedrick, Jane Field, Robert Williamson, G.E. Cates, that's George Cates. I don't know who the Jones Jr. I think it's Marshall Jones Jr. James and Francis Kirkpatrick. And this name right here is Waxenberger, I believe, who was an older member of the- Oh, that's Mary, yeah, Mary, uh, 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 yeah. An older woman, that's right. Thank you, Beth. And now to, back to you, Beth. Well, I, I, I think that were, Jones is Walk C. Jones Jr., it looks like. Yes. Uh, the letters, I think the reason that there were more than one letter was because they were taken to uh, a young adult Sunday school classes. And that's one of the ways that we managed to, to get the signatures together. So I'll let you you uh, respond to, the, to the outcome of that letter or what happened as a result of it. So um, the session received the letters and said, thank you very much, we're moving on. There was no action taken out of the letters. The other letter that, that we mentioned, and I'll just mention this briefly,
the week before Martin Luther King was killed, a group of young adults did take, I'm not even sure it was a letter, but, but we requested a meeting with the session and asked if, the, if Idlewild would make a statement on behalf of the, of the sanitation workers. And we were thanked and dismissed, and, but that was the previous letter. Beth, would you tell us about the coffee house? Does it play that's, into this story? That's, per that's Perry's story, not mine. Uh, okay. That's sort of off the point here, but I love to talk about it some other time. Well, can you speak to the coffee house, Perry? And I think what the, the, the connection to the coffee house is that Bill Aldridge really advocates, began that ministry, advocated for that ministry, and that ministry gathered um, the reprobates together. <laughs> um, Perry, I'm going to turn to you and let you tell that story, but it became a point of conflict for the church in some ways because of who was gathering there. Okay. So, Perry. Uh, the coffee house, we met in the basement of Idlewild for a while, in the basement of the Jones building, and Bill had this idea, and Bill and Elizabeth and Percy and I went to Nashville to meet with the downtown Presbyterian church who started one. And we stayed with my parents and uh, we came back and started it. And what we really thought was, it was gonna be a lot of young adults like us. We were gonna watch French movies and discuss the theological importance. You know, but the best thing that happened was we found other churches who came in on the ministry. And I think I'm right in saying it was the first time that the Midtown churches had gotten together about anything. And it was Grace St. Luke, St. Mary's Episcopal, St. John's Methodist, um, somebody else. Anyway, they, we rented a, a place right across from Old Crump Stadium and opened the coffee house on Saturdays and Sundays there, staffed always by volunteers from all of these churches. And we had programs at least once a week, uh, usually the ministers of one of the churches or from anybody in the community. Um, here's what happened. It was a ministry. It wasn't exactly who we thought we were going to be serving. It turned out that people poured in on weekends. A lot of them were runaways. We'd never heard of runaways. You know, we all came from nice families. Um, drugs. We still thought drugs were that thing out in California. And it was, you know, right here on the streets close to our church. Um, the sailors at Millington who had no place to go. Lots of disaffected young people came. And as I say, that's not the ministry we expected, but it's the one with which we were presented. Uh, there was an apartment building right around the corner from the coffee house that was slipped in by some older people. And they complained about the noisy young people sitting out side on the sidewalk smoking and things. And that got back to the churches. And Percy and Bill were called to the session to explain or defend the coffee house. Women were not only not allowed on the session, we weren't allowed to go to the meeting. And Elizabeth Aldridge and Betsy Lunds, who taught at Idlewild, and I stood under the windows of the room where the session was meeting, trying to hear what they were saying, because we were not allowed to even come to the meeting. And we thought it was as much our project as theirs. But what finally happened is, Percy and Bill were explaining and defending the coffee house. And finally, one of the older members said, are these people sinners? And I think Bill said, uh, yes, sir. He says, well, then let the boys have their coffee house. And that's how it ended up. And it went, it lasted a, a, about nine years, but it gave birth to Runaway House and Memphis House, which was the first uh, outpatient drug treatment center in Memphis. So it had those effects too. And yes, Beth. Could I make one other uh, just uh, 
comment or remember one other thing, sort of in response to the letter that, that the young ops took to the session. Over years, there was what we sort of called the red door controversy. We felt like we had such a wonderful opportunity to bring the neighborhood children into our worship and even in our youth activities. And we would over and over talk about the possibilities that, that were there to do that, but nothing ever happened. It, you know, you, you start talking about inviting them to come to, to the uh, basic or to the youth programs. And you get tied up in, well, what are the risks and what are the problems? And we, we talked about having, inviting them for worship, especially honoring coaches. And these things just never happened, even though we had such a wonderful opportunity there. Um, we were too timid, I guess. The session minutes document um, many conversations that the session wrestled through about whether or not we could have, in, our children could be integrated with, um, the language is Negro children in the minutes. And that just seemed to be a constant conversation in the session minutes that, um, but of, uh, you know, as a pastor of the church for almost 20 years, I've always, the, the, the story I've always told is we were the first, we were out there and we integrated with this recreation ministry. But what I see reading the minutes back to 1950 is that it has been a, it was a struggle that for that integration to happen was a struggle and, um, Eventually we got there, but it wasn't an overnight situation. So Beth, kind of on that note, I wanna push us into um, a letter that Idlewild received. And this, this letter came from Parkway Gardens Presbyterian Church, what was uh, at the time a, an African-American church. Um, and this letter got lost. And so in the session minutes, eventually Harry Welford, who's still living, um, who was the clerk of the session at the time, wrote an apology to Parkway Gardens for having misplaced this letter. But I wanna share uh, this letter. So this is dated April 4th, 1968. And it reads, the session of Parkway Gardens Presbyterian Church went on record a few months ago with you, extending an invitation to a group of members from your congregation who would be interested in conversation, dialogue, worship, and work together for at least two months or maybe four months, six months, a year, and longer. We are, we are suggesting that participating members would be offered a variety of experiences from which to learn visits into the homes of members. Members, You will get to know people. Weekend and summer vacation with Negro children and their families. Teachers, co-teachers of church school classes. Members of the choir, both for adults and children. Member of class and Christian action. We discuss, we discuss the hot issues of today. This class meets each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. beginning Sunday, April 7th. We will have a second session at 7 p.m. Regular 11 a.m. worship service. Wednesday worship and study. Wednesday 7 p.m. worship, prayer, and visitation. Volunteer work with the church and community as follows. Working with scouts and their families, working in the church office one to two hours a day, calling on prospective members weekly one to three hours, calling on shut-ins weekly, one to three hours, writing for the church newspaper weekly, one to two hours, helping to get out the church paper two hours weekly, community survey for developing the black community with a view towards coming, with a view towards becoming self-governing, self-determining and self-supporting, membership recruitment for the NAACP. We trust that you will encourage those in your congregation to share this experience with us this invitation is for all age groups. So that is a letter that um, kind of got lost in the pipeline. Um, Do you notice one of the, uh, on the letterhead, I can't remember now which position is Tom Hamilton. It's Jean's husband. He was a member of Parkway Garden. Mm -hmm. He was the treasurer. 
Um, gosh, I feel like we are moving through this at like lightning speed. Um, Sarah, uh, in light that it's 1032, would you like me to continue? I've got one more thing that I think I'd like to share. Um, so I'm gonna fast forward in time to 1972. And this is just another plea that comes before the session. So uh, there was a young man, African-American and his friends who borrowed his dad's truck and they went out joyriding one night. They ended up getting chased by the police through many counties and um, the police reports were disputed about what happened to, um, his name was Elton Hayes. But um, eventually, uh, so the session receives, um, I'm just gonna read this paragraph, it speaks for itself. Mr. Grieven reported on behalf of the service committee regarding a resolution approved by the Christian Action Committee, a copy of which resolution is attached hereto, but not copied herein, entitled a statement of concern and addresses itself to the recent events in Memphis surrounding the death of Elton Hayes and the divisive, divisive undercurrent of fear, suspicion and hate in the city. Grieven advised that the service committee had not voted to record this passage of this resolution, but had voted to request that it be presented to the session without recommendation. Following, Dr. Lacey presented the resolution and moved as follows, that the session adopt the statement of principle, that it can be read from the pulpit and that a copy of the statement and a statement that it has been adopted by Idlewild session be sent to the sessions of other Presbyterian churches in Shelby County. Um, so that was, the situation was uh, police brutality. The police, um, Canale was the, uh, the coroner for Shelby County at the time, and he ruled the death was homicide. And the police report had ruled that death, the police report indicated that he had been thrown from the car in an accident. The other two boys who were in the car with him told a different story. And so the police, 23 police officers were discharged from the Memphis police because of this story in 1972. So the session, um, uh, the session read from the pulpit, supposedly from that session, I don't have memory of this, but supposedly read from the pulpit was that statement about, we have to do something about this. We are concerned about um, these activities in the city. So just over a period of time. Sarah, I think that's probably enough. I'm just gonna pause there and see if we can answer any questions. Stephanie, go ahead. I have a question for Beth. Um, what do you think finally broke the ice uh, because we did our recreation program and some other efforts did begin to uh, welcome black children. Was there a certain event or person? Oh, I, I think that the welcome was uh, from the beginning was warm in the recreation department. Uh, and, you know, I, I said many times, Tom Hamilton's coming was a great gift. Uh, the timing of that was so important. It mattered so much. But I don't think that that same welcome even now has been afforded to the rest. I mean, we've, as far as I know, we still don't invite, invite our recreation children into the, our larger church program. Um, it's, it seems to me it's been kept uh, sort of two separate things, unless somebody can correct me on that. But. And we had so many families. I mean, we had the chance to, the, not just children, but we had we knew we knew the families of lots of these children. So we had a chance. You know, but, Dan um, Odie was the one minister I think who um, really 
made an extraordinary effort. And that was during my children's time in the recreation program and in basic. And uh, Dan went to great lengths to incorporate several of the, um, the kids who were in that program. I think it, they were all boys. Um, Isaac Wooldridge was, you know, one of the most eager, but uh, he made sure they came to Nakomi and, you know, came to basic and all, but that's the only time I've been aware that it's been pursued very actively. Well, um, what we've talked about today, let's go back to the beginning. The stories we like to tell ourselves and the stories as it really happened. Uh, have we deceived ourselves about lots of other things? An awful lot happened right after the garbage strike was settled and Idlewild had a part in, in forming MIFA. Uh, yeah, but one of the things was torched, teenagers in Christian outreach or something, which you, you hear a lot about things like this today, but this was the first one. One Saturday a month, black and white teenagers would come together at the church and do some service project, you know, rake somebody's yard or paint a house or something like that. And that was Louise McComb, who was the DCE at the time, thought that up. And many things did begin to change. But today we've talked about an awful lot of uh, lost opportunities. So I go back to what I thought all along, how much today in the whole Black Lives Matter and anti-racism discussions that are going on right now remind me so much of the 60s. And um, here, you know, let's don't miss any more opportunities. We've got a new preacher coming and he'll want to put his stamp on things. And he might resent that we thought we'd been doing it, uh, writing a racial roadmap for the church. But um, just think about the things that might have been. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm watching a very active chat over here and I had notes, <laughs> you know, we're not coming just to the end of today, but we're coming to the end of, um, uh, what has been a journey that we've taken, you know, since August. And I have a lot of sort of concluding notes that now feel inadequate <laughs> to the task. I'm not sure really how to wrap us up here. And, and um, perhaps that's because there is no way to wrap up <laughs> today. Um, in some ways, this is really just uh, the beginning. I, I think what I'm sitting with right now, and I knew this was coming, is that letter from um, Parkway Gardens that came. I mean, really hours after Dr. King's assassination. And what I hear in that letter is, um, is a plea. <laughs> it's a plea to be, uh, you know, just to siblings. It's a plea to siblings in Christ to be seen um, and to be known <laughs> as people. Um, so, you know, we always have that question. <laughs> Uh, at the end of these presentations, what are you feeling um, and what are you going to do with um, with those feelings, trusting that feelings are informative? Um, so I think I would invite you all to do a little homework between now and uh, January 3, which is when we will reconvene. We're going to take a couple weeks off, uh, but this is clearly not the end. Um, you know, it was always our intention um, to move from, you know, the question of how my racial identity is shaped and reshaped uh, by the history I've learned and the circumstances I've encountered in my life and move it to the congregation um, and the conversation about our, our racial identity as a uh, predominantly white, um, predominantly affluent uh, Presbyterian congregation in Midtown Memphis. Um, and uh, it's not work that we can conclude, you know, today. Um, so I think I'm, 
I'm, I'm going to invite you to do a little homework and we'll bring it back on January 3rd. Um, so if you have something to scribble with, uh, go ahead and, and pick up that pen or open a Word doc. Um, and you're going to start with that question. What feelings emerged during this presentation and what am I going to do with those feelings? Um, don't skip over that question. <laughs> it might be the most important one um, that you answer for yourself. Um, Sarah, second. Yeah, Ann. Just one piece. <laughs> I feel like I want to get one more not nugget in here. As early as 1952, the church through the session created an opportunity called Operation C, S E E. And it was, it was an acknowledgement that we are an affluent white congregation. It was not named racially, but it's that we need to get out of our homes and we need to go see the poverty that's right next door. And so that was a mission of the church in 1952, Operation C, to go see the poor people. I, there is all sorts of stuff to unpack in that, in terms of just going and seeing the poor people. But um the church has long been at this conversation. I don't want to lose that piece as you wrap us up. Thanks, Sam. Lots of that came from women who went to the Ford Road School and who tutored and who had an early, early start in that. Um... Women were important in this journey, but they didn't have a voice at the table of leadership, which is that 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 emerges pretty clearly in the session. Yeah, and look what's happened since. <laughs> oh, let me just finish the Bill Aldrich story. He came back to Memphis uh, maybe 10 years later as uh, part of the faculty at Memphis Theological Seminary. And he was here for a while and then he died. All right, y'all, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm always the herder <laughs> in this space. <laughs> Sometimes I'd like to step out of the moderator role and just be part of the conversation. Um, I'm gonna bring you back to your homework though, I'm sorry. <laughs> so begin with those feelings, okay? Um, what has emerged during this presentation? What am I gonna do with it? Um, second, you know, the kind of the key to this whole racial roadmap um, exercise is that you're you're telling the story as if you were playing it in a movie, um, but then you're doing the interpretive work. You're saying, um, what did I learn from this? What did I take with me? How did this event um, form me for, for good and for ill? Um, so the second question is, what did we learn? Um, from the moments, what did we as a congregation learn um, from the moments and the events described by Anne and Perry and Beth today? Um, and third, how do we see those learnings in the way that we engage issues of race today? We're gonna take sort of that leap of faith perhaps in um, trusting that this is not something that just kind of exists in a vacuum and in history, but it's something that is kind of in our DNA today. So um, how have those learnings shaped how we continue to engage um, issues of race today? Can you write these down for us and distribute it? I can do that. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, Y'all, we're going to take a two-week break. We're going to come back on January 3rd, same time. I can't promise it's the same place because it's Zoom links, but probably the same place, <laughs> but we'll let you know. Um, a lot of this is going to feel the same next semester. We're going to continue with these racial roadmaps. Um, a difference is that, you know, we've been learning about the racism that's manifest in different systems this semester. So looking at criminal justice and education and healthcare. Uh, next semester, we're going to move towards um, kind of away from, from learning about that and towards learning from uh, people outside of our system who are engaged in anti-racism work um, in their own context. So we're going to hear from a couple of people um, that are kind of pretty high up in the denomination. Um, Jimmy Hawkins is one of them. He's the director of the Office of Public Witness in DC. We're going to hear from a pastor in Atlanta um, who's doing 
a lot of parish work um, in anti-racism is a good model for that. Um, we're going to do a little bit more work around a theology of anti-racism, uh, grounding this work spiritually and making sure we have the language from our own faith tradition to kind of ground what we're doing. Um, and we're going to do even more introspective work. So um, especially introspection that, you know, kind of comes to the issue of complicity and, and kind of discovering and, and naming that racism that, um, that lives in us. Um, living into the core of our Christian identity there, really, um, in those words that we say every Sunday. If, um, if we say we have no sin, <laughs> we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And that's where we begin. Um, and then of course, moving uh, forward as a people who, uh, who can really, who are freed to move forward meaningfully and effectively because we've done that hard work. So I hope that you will stay with us. Um, this is really, this is important work. This is faithful work. Um, so thank you for being with us. Um, most of you have been with us since August. So thank you for staying, <laughs> staying the course and please come back in January. All right. And thank you, Anne. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Steve, who got us started with part one of Idlewild's racial roadmap a few weeks ago. Yeah, I like to see that. Thanks, y'all. All right. Go in peace and we'll see you in worship. <laughs>